uh, that has been implemented only this year. So let me just briefly describe what it is. Um, so, you know, you see in uh, the conference called Economics and Computations, for short, EC and WINE, have a lot of, uh, you know, in common in terms of topics and also in terms of uh, overlapping communities. So the idea is to establish uh, some connections, uh, you know, some concrete connections and also use the synergies between two uh, conferences. So it was proposed by the ACM SIGACT leadership to, to bring uh, um, winner of the presentation award at one conference to present their work at another. Uh, and actually, they, uh, the SIG Act would cover all the expenses. Unfortunately, it's not so helpful this year, but you know they would do it, I think, hopefully in the future. I also hope that this kind of events will, uh, uh, will continue and it will become a serious, uh, a common thing for wine and C because it puts a good incentives for people not only to write uh, you know good papers uh, and uh, do their best for the for the paper writing but also do their best for presentations um yeah so that's basically the event so let me very briefly introduce uh, kira so kira graduated from uh, uh, university of washington and now she's postdoctoral researcher at columbia university so we are really fortunate to have uh, her here uh, so that she can give, you know, the, the most awesome talk from EC, you know, basically the best you would find um, at EC this year. So her talk is uh, on optimal mechanism design for single-minded agents, and uh, we are happy to have you here. Thank you, Nick. I wish I was able to be there in person. I think we all wish we were able to be there in person. Um, so this is joint work with my co-authors, Nikhil Devanur, Raghavansh Saxena, Ariel Schwartzman, and Matt Weinberg. Okay, so one of the most fundamental questions within the algorithmic game theory community is how can we maximize a seller's revenue, right? We have a seller, she's trying to sell, for example, an apple and an orange. We have some buyer, for example, her value for the apple is $7, her value for the orange is $5, her values are additive if she gets both, her values are drawn from some prior distribution which is known to the seller. And so the question that we ask is, what mechanism, what truthful mechanism maximizes the seller's expected revenue? Now, if the seller is only selling an apple, then this question is completely resolved. She just posts the best price over all prices. And this has been resolved since 1981, since Morrison won a Nobel Prize. Everything is lovely. As soon as we get to selling two different items, an apple and an orange, we know nothing. This is extremely complex. We do not know what the optimal mechanism is. So it is a core open problem. How do we optimally maximize revenue beyond just one item, beyond one parameter for the buyer? So what happens when we go from one item with an apple to two items with an apple and an orange? For one item, it's simple, it's easy to compute, and there's only one real option offered to the buyer. Just take it for that price of $4 or whatever the optimal price is, or don't participate. But as soon as we get to two items, it can be intractable to compute. There can be uncountably infinite options. For example, I could offer you one lottery ticket that says flip a certain coin and with that probability you get the apple, flip another coin with that probability you get the orange. And then I could vary those probabilities just a little bit, change the price and now I have another option. And in this way I could create uncountably infinite different lottery options. And we still know very little about how to do this, how to find the optimal mechanism, what it looks like, et cetera. And as you'll notice, going from one item to two items, there's a huge gap there. That's like a pretty big difference as we go from just something really, really simple to complete chaos. And so another open problem that's been a main open problem is what optimal mechanisms can we characterize? What settings beyond one item are tractable? So what optimal results do we know for two or more items? Well, there's been a lot of really, really brilliant work in this area, and yet essentially no multi-parameter settings are known where we have general optimal mechanisms without restrictions on the distributions. So I'm going to tell you about a lot of brilliant results, and yet none of them are either general or without restrictions. That doesn't mean that they didn't have a lot of work go into them and they're not extremely impressive, but they're still in some way restricted. So the first sort of category is restricted distributions. For example, 
two parameters, each uniform zero one with quadratic utility. So that's very specific. And each of these has kind of a very, very specific restricted distribution. For these, we do know the optimal mechanism. The second category is saying, what if we were to take a specific mechanism that we like, for example, selling the grand bundle, we just take all the items, put them together and put one price on this bundle. When is that the optimal mechanism? We find some condition under which this is the optimal mechanism. That's the second sort of results. And there's a third line of work that basically says, what if we were to formulate some optimization problem and try and solve it in polynomial time? When can we then find the optimal mechanism? But it doesn't actually give you what the optimal mechanism looks like or any more details than that. It's just sort of non-constructive algorithms. So this is basically the state of what we knew up until a couple of years ago. Now what we have is a new line of work of sort of these interdimensional settings that sit between one item and two items. And so here we have some settings like the FedEx problem and budgets, which I'll tell you about more later to sort of contextualize what I'm going to talk about today, but I'm going to save that for the end of the talk. And what I wanna talk about today is the single-minded setting and as well as the multi-unit pricing setting. And I'm going to explain to you how these settings are interdimensional or somehow between fully, fully multidimensional like two items, but they're not just a single item. They're definitely multidimensional, but they're more structured than that, okay? And I'm also going to explain by what metrics do I mean that. So let's start with the single-minded setting. That's our main setting that we discuss in this paper. What is the single-minded setting? In the single-minded setting, there are a bunch of different bundles being offered and the buyer has some particular bundle that she's interested in. So this bundle might be bundle C, just Wi-Fi that we're selling, or bundle A, which is Wi-Fi and a landline, or bundle B, which is Wi-Fi and TV service. And the buyer has some particular bundle, A, B, or C, that she's interested in buying. She also has a value of how much getting her bundle is worth to her. So for example, if her bundle is C, if she just wants Wi-Fi, she's perfectly content getting bundle A or bundle B because it also contains Wi-Fi. She doesn't mind also getting a landline or also getting TV. However, if she wants bundle A, then she's not happy getting any bundle except for A because no other bundle also has Wi-Fi and phone contained in it. These value and bundle pairs are drawn from some distribution, which is known to the seller. And as you notice, because certain bundles satisfy her and others don't, they're in some way partially ordered. So in some way, bundles A and B are better than bundle C because they also contain bundle C. So they are partially ordered by the containment relation, okay? So in some way, they dominate them in a partial order. Now this compares to FedEx, where the buyer has a deadline and a value, such as one-day shipping or two-day shipping and three-day shipping, but these deadlines are totally ordered. The shipping options are totally ordered. So in the FedEx setting, we have totally ordered options and here we have partially ordered options. So this is a generalization of the FedEx setting. Okay, what are our results? So the most simple setting needs to have at least three different bundles. Otherwise it would just go back to the FedEx setting because it would be totally ordered. So in the setting where in the directed acyclic graph or DAG representation of the partial ordering, there is out degree at most one. So each uh, bundle is dominated by at most one other directly. Then the FedEx solution actually applies. And we can just pour in exactly what was done by Fiat et al. Um, and it's not immediate to see, but it only takes a couple extra lines of math. So this is actually quite an easy special case. When we move to a more general case of where we have this bundle of, for example, Wi-Fi dominated by two other bundles, we can also look at another special case. This special case is when each of the marginal distributions is what we call DMR. So what DMR means is that in value space, the revenue curve of each marginal distribution is going to be concave and F times phi, where phi is the Meyerson virtual value is increasing. So you should compare this to regularity, Meyerson regularity, where the quantile space revenue curve is concave and just phi is increasing. Instead here we have the value space revenue curve is concave or F times V is increasing, okay? That's the difference between regularity and DMR. So under DMR, what we can do is we can get an algorithmic characterization for our dual variables 
our whole approach is going to be via duality. And by using this sort of greedy flow-based algorithm, we can exactly characterize our dual variables and find that our allocation is actually going to be deterministic under this condition of DMR. Finally, in the most general case, what we do is we characterize um, the allocation via sort of dual properties. And then we find that the menu complexity or um, how much randomization is in the allocation is unbounded, but finite. So how many different allocation probabilities there are in the optimal mechanism in the worst case is unbounded, but finite. What do I mean by unbounded? I mean that for any M that you give me, there exists some distribution over the value bundle pairs such that the optimal mechanism for that instance has at least M different options. So you can give me any M and I will create an instance where the allocation has that much randomness. So we can make it as large as we want to, and yet it's always going to be finite. It can never be infinite. Okay? So let's see how. So as I said, the whole proof relies on duality machinery, and I'm going to try and keep it light for the talk, but just give the high level. So the main idea that we really need here is the theorem for any optimal dual solution, every optimal primal must satisfy complementary slackness with that dual solution. Otherwise, the primal could not be optimal. So if you take some optimal dual solution, every possible primal solution that is optimal must also satisfy complementary slackness with that dual solution. So what we're going to do is we're first going to review complementary slackness and conditions for optimality in this setting. Then I'm going to show you a dual solution for which these uh, conditions for optimality or complementary slackness would imply that the allocation or the primal needs to have high menu complexity. So this will be our lower bound proof. Okay, so I'll show you uh, a construction for which we have high menu complexity. Then what I need to do is I just give you some dual solution. It's not optimal. This needs to be an optimal dual solution. So I need to prove that there exists an instance for which this dual, this construction I made, is optimal. So what that means is first I need to show you that a distribution causes this dual. And for this to be optimal, there exists a primal solution that satisfies complementary slackness with it. So that both are optimal together. So that's how we prove that this construction I came up with is optimal. Then what I'm going to do, so that's the lower bound part. Then I'm going to prove an upper bound on many complexity. And the way I do that is that I prove that for any optimal dual, we can find the corresponding optimal allocation and thus upper bound is many complexity. And the way I do this is I use some algorithm on the duals, but in order to use my algorithm, I need the duals to have a particular structure. And so we prove some results that say, for a dual to be optimal, it must have a particular structure. But this is a short talk, so I'm just gonna skip these later parts and just focus on these earlier parts in high level. So let's start with reviewing complementary slackness. Okay, so here I formulated um, a Lagrangian dual of our problem. So the optimization problem is just maximize revenue um, subject to incentive compatibility and feasibility. So down here I have my primal, that exact maximize expected revenue constraints. So what are they? They're just saying you should report your, your bundle, you the buyer, your bundle over any other bundle and your value over any other value. And these are sort of simplified compared to the original problem because of the nice structure of the problem. And so I bring them in terms of the allocation. Up here we have the dual, which I've just flipped minimize and maximize because it's a dual and written in in terms of some dual variables once I've taken the partial Lagrangian. Okay. So for each primal constraint, I'll assign a dual variable. And now I'm going to explain to you how I pictorially represent um, my dual. The first thing that I wanna show you is that if we have an optimal uh, allocation here, given whatever dual variables I give you. So I'm going to talk about what should the, the allocation look like given some dual variables. Suppose that these, this right here, these dual variables are positive. Then in order for this allocation to truly maximize this quantity, given that a feasible allocation is between zero and one, if phi here is positive and A maximizes this quantity, then A better be one. If this is positive, then we want this to be as large as possible, so A should be one in order to maximize this quantity. Similarly, 
if B is negative and A maximizes this quantity, negative would hurt this quantity, so A better be zero. If B is zero, then it doesn't matter what A is because it doesn't impact this quantity. A's job here is to maximize this quantity for whatever phi is. That's just what it says right here, okay? So right here, a plus sign means that phi is positive, so A needs to be one by optimality. If phi is negative, A better be zero. That's the first thing we see. Secondly, what do we have via complementary slackness? Complementary slackness tells us that if our dual variables are positive, then our primal constraints better be tight, okay? So first we have that if our lambda constraint is positive, then this primal constraint better be tight. So the allocation being weakly increasing better be tight. And what that turns into is that the allocation needs to be constant, okay? Secondly, what we get here is that if our alpha variable is positive, then this constraint right here about the area under A, which corresponds to utility, better be tight. So the area under, um, I want you to think of this as C versus A, needs to be tight compared to the area under A. So C needs to always pre be preferred to A, otherwise C would pre report itself to A. And here it's saying this needs to be tight. So if C is equally preferable to A, or the area underneath is tight, then that means in this case, these are equally preferable, but C is always preferable to B. And therefore, A is now preferable to B by transitivity. So what we get is that if this constraint between A and C is positive, then A is preferable to B at that value. So there's at least as much area under A than there is under B for the allocation. OK, so this is what our complementary slackness constraints tell us. So here's our construction. Here's the dual that I'm giving you that I just came up with out of nowhere, and I'm going to show you why it works. First, let's start up here. Up here, we get at this x1 in B that we have a plus sign. The virtual value is positive. What we know is that if the virtual value is positive, then the allocation has to be 1. OK, so the allocation at x1 in B must be 1. Now we have an arrow going into x1 at A, which means that here our alpha, sorry, I forgot to explain that. An oval means that lambda is positive, an arrow going in means that alpha is positive, and a plus sign or a minus sign means that the virtual values are corresponding. Here we have an arrow going into A at x1, which means that the alpha is positive, which means that A is preferable to B at x1 which means that there's at least as much area under the allocation at x1 than in A than at B, which means that since this is positive, this better also be positive if we need to have at least as much area. So this is positive. Now in this oval, lambda is positive, so the allocation is constant. So if the allocation is positive at x1, it's the same at x2, so it's also positive all the way down to the bottom of the iron interval. Okay, now we look over at x2 in B, and we have an arrow going into it. So again, the alpha constraint is positive. So B is at least as preferable to A. So there's at least as much area underneath. In order for there to be at least as much area underneath the allocation, we again need it to at least be positive. And then we're again in this interval where the allocation is constant. And so down to the bottom, it's positive. So what I've done here is I've argued my way all the way down by these complementary slackness constraints that every point needs to have a non-zero allocation. Now what I'm going to do is argue my way back up that all of them need to be distinct. So for whatever the allocation is at this point, we know it's positive. Let's just assume it's some C. Whatever it is, this red line. Now let's look at the allocation up here at x2. We see that at x2 and a, the allocation needs to be, uh, the area under the allocation needs to be at least as much as a as it is at b. And yet there is much less space for which it's positive because we know it's zero where it's negative. So we have this much space to integrate over essentially, as opposed to this much space. And so if they were the same, we could not possibly have as much, at least as much area under the allocation curve. And so it needs to be strictly greater in order for the area under the allocation to be at least as much. Therefore, 
the allocation needs to be at least as much here because the allocation is constant on this interval. And so we will argue our way back up that at each point, because of these utilities or allocation under the, or area under the allocation curve, that it needs to be strictly increasing. And so what we do is we then just extend this construction as long as we want to for any M, and we argue all the way down that it needs to be uh, non-zero, and then we argue all the way back up that it needs to be distinct at every point. And so what we wind up with is we wind up with at least M distinct allocation probabilities, or at least M different uh, points of support in our randomness, and thus at least uh, menu complexity M. Okay, so why is there an instance that actually causes this dual? Basically, it's just some tedious mechanical math to reverse engineer a distribution from the dual. So what we do is we come up with a theorem that says, for whatever dual that's only really given by the signs of the virtual values and whether or not uh, the values are negative or not, or sorry, non-negative or not, then there exists some distribution that causes this dual. And so therefore the bad dual that I just constructed exists. So all that tedious math that you would have to do, we basically took care of by coming up with a theorem that just says, now you can just do the fun part and play with duals. And we know that there's gonna be a distribution that exists for it. Um, I do wanna say that this crucially only really works for these interdimensional settings where there is a payment identity. Okay. Finally, I wanna briefly give a cute vignette about the upper bound. Um, why is it not uh, infinite. I just showed you that it could go as long as any sequence. What if we just had an infinite sequence? So suppose we had an infinite sequence. An infinite such sequence would have to be bounded in monotone, and therefore it would have to converge to some x star. And it turns out in that case, we could just sort of abort all these chains of uh, constraints and just set this price x star, and then our our number of prices here would actually just be one and not the length of the sequence. So this is why it could never be infinite. Okay. So going back to our proof sketch, we reviewed complementary slackness. We looked at what a dual was that implied high menu complexity for alert on. This was the chain construction that we talked through. Um, this used complementary slackness to do so. To prove an instance for which this dual was optimal, this was that master theorem I talked about that showed that you could always reverse engineer one. Um, we skipped uh, proving that there exists a primal solution that certifies that it's optimal. Um, we also skipped showing that for any optimal dual, we can find an optimal primal and that for a dual to be optimal, it must have a particular structure. But we did talk about the infinite sequence for the upper bound. And I just wanna say for the three parts we skipped, basically what you do is you say, look at this dual, in order for it to be optimal, I need to not be able to do these particular operations, which would make it even better. And therefore, it needs to have some certain properties. This is the particular structure it must have. And because of that, then I can run this algorithm we came up with, which always gives us a, uh, an allocation that is optimal with it. OK. So where does that leave us? That leaves us that we have this whole spectrum of menu complexity. We go from, with one item, the many complexity is one, as we know by Meyerson. And when we get to two items, it's uncountably infinite. For FedEx and budgets, so FedEx is the case where we have uh, one day, two day, and three day shipping. Budgets is the case where we have $5, $10, and $12 budgets. Both of these are exponential menu complexity. They're both totally ordered and they're both exponential menu complexity. But when we get to the single-minded setting, we get to this unbounded but finite. What's more is for the multi-unit pricing setting, which is where you could have one, two, or three, basically you're added up to some private demand cap. We show that our lower bound also applies to that setting, but we do not prove an upper bound for that setting. So all we can say is that it's at least unbounded, but we don't know what the upper bound is. And we also introduce a new setting called coordinated valuations, where we show that that setting is actually countably infinite. And we sort of, uh, it's basically the same as single-minded, but we add some functions between the settings and we sort of engineer it so that it's countably infinite. So now we've filled out this whole spectrum going from one to uncountably infinite, so that it's not just this weird dichotomy, but actually a spectrum with everything filled out in between. In addition to a spectrum of menu complexity, 
we also now have a spectrum in terms of how do we characterize the optimal mechanism. So for one item, we have just this perfect closed form Myersonian theory. And for two items, we don't really have any characterization at all. For the FedEx setting, there are closed form dual variables that we can just write down. For both the budget setting and the single-minded setting, what we do is we say we have these properties where the dual needs to look like something, otherwise we would be able to improve the dual. So this is what I was just telling you. For the multi-unit pricing setting, we don't have any such characterization yet. And yet for all of these settings, we do have that this condition DMR, which I told you is like regularity and yet in value space instead of quantile space, for all of them implies that they're deterministic. So the menu complexity drops to one when you have this DMR uh, condition. Okay, so lastly, I just wanna say, I think there's a lot more work to do in this space of interdimensional problems. We could ask about menu complexity for approximation instead of just optimal mechanisms. We could ask about multiple buyers. Most of this work is just for a single buyer or uh, um, we could also ask about measuring the settings by other metrics such as how many samples would it take to learn the mechanism? How many additional buyers would make up for using a simpler mechanism? Or what I think would be really interesting is if we turn to other objectives or models, which are known to be very difficult to study and use these settings as sort of something simpler than just the uh, multidimensional two or more items to get a grip on them. For example, two-sided markets, optimizing gains from trade, residual surplus and so forth. So thank you. Um, thank you, Kira, for the great talk. Uh, so I don't think uh, participants send, have sent any questions, but actually I do have a question. Um, so basically we're talking about randomized allocations here when we talk about menu complexity and this bound is basically for randomized allocations. But for, exactly. for, this, for the single-minded setting, it's actually uh, seems a bit um, implausible. I mean, if if the buyer gets bundles that doesn't really covers all her demand, you know, uh, items in her demand, she's really unhappy and like probably she's going to return uh, the kind of result of such a lottery. So I wonder what what can we say about uh, deterministic um, or yeah, like basically deterministic pricings where we price bundles. So, so this is pricing bundles. The randomness is not over which bundle you get, but it's over whether or not you get the bundle. So I'm saying you'll always get the bundle that you want or you won't get it. I'm not gonna say you might get a bundle that you're not happy with. You just might not get a bundle at all but you're not gonna pay if you don't get a bundle. So for example, I could run the mechanism as I'm gonna flip a coin and offer you a price for the bundle. And like, you can you can formulate the mechanism in a, in a lot of ways. And one way to formulate it is I'm going to randomize the price for my bundle, which is the bundle that you want. And either you're gonna be happy with the price or not. So what I'm really randomizing here is the price. Okay. And so you're choosing whether or not to buy the bundle depending on whether the price is satisfactory to you or not. So first you look at all the bundles, you look at all the randomized prices, you commit to the bundle you want, which by incentive compatibility is going to be your bundle. And then I will draw a price from the randomized price and you will see, is it below your value or not? If it's not, you can't then go back and buy another bundle, but you're never gonna get stuck with a bundle that's not satisfactory to you. In terms of deterministic, uh, aside from knowing that DMR gives you that uh, deterministic is optimal, uh, I don't know much aside from the fact that, of course, it's at least a uh, one over the number of bundles approximation. Okay, yeah, I guess we need to finish because the next talk is coming very soon. Sure. Thanks, Kira.